One of the central problems that Antonio Gramsci addresses in the prison notebooks is how the educational system would have to be reformed in order for it to contribute to overcoming class alienation. And in a section of the, of the prison notebooks called On Education, he lays out his model of what he calls the common school, the kind of schooling system that would allow individuals from different classes to develop bonds of solidarity so as to prevent the kind of class divisions that, according to him, are running rampant in the status quo in the 1920s and 30s, um, ever since the emergence of capitalism. Now, to think about the context of his discussion of education, um, and there are two things to consider here. The first one is the context relative to Marxism and Marxist theory, because his account of what he calls the common school is a direct response to a problem that emerges in Marxist theory about how workers can come into class consciousness. In other words, how does a worker, especially um, a factory worker who is working 12 to 18 hours a day and whose body and mind is fatigued by exploitative labor, how does that worker ever become aware or conscious of their own exploitation and think about how to overcome it? How, in other words, do they educate themselves so as to become class conscious? Now, Marx does talk about education in various places, but there is a sense in which Marx simply seems to believe that workers, by virtue of their own suffering, were sort, will sort of just snap into class consciousness. And so some people have argued that Marx doesn't pay enough attention to education and just assumes that the suffering of the working class will somehow produce its own education, um, almost like a eureka moment uh, whereby the workers will just suddenly uh, realize that they are in fact being oppressed and that they need to um, organize so as to overthrow the dominant class. Now, Lenin, Marx's most important early reader, became aware of this problem. And in an essay that is entitled, What is to be done? Question mark, he says that we need to go beyond Marx in thinking about the role of education in connection to communism because what we need really are socialist educators who will come to the workers and basically tell them what's up. You know, this is your reality. I need to educate you. It's a very top-down pedagogical model. And so on the one hand, you have Marx, who doesn't really say much and expects a, a bottom-up um, coming into consciousness of the worker. And on the other hand, you have Lenin, who has a very top-down pedagogical model um, with socialist educators telling the workers what it is that they need to know. And then you have Gramsci, who worries essentially that neither the Marxist nor the Leninist approach is particularly good, um, and who feels the need to articulate a much more comprehensive account of the role that education needs to play in Marxist theory and praxis. And that's why education plays, again, such a central role in the prison notebooks, from his discussion of intellectuals to his discussion of the common school. Now, he seemed to believe that you certainly cannot leave workers to their own devices. You cannot throw them to the wolves and then expect them to, what, educate themselves in their almost non-existent leisurely time, um, leisure time. But he also believed that you cannot wait until they are adults in order to receive the kind of formation that is important for uh, socialist struggle. And so neither Marx nor Lenin is right. And there's a really famous, often quoted passage from the chapter on education where Gramsci basically says, look, you can't wait until somebody is 40 years old to get them to have a fundamental insight or realization about their own condition as exploited workers. And so education for Gramsci actually has to begin from a very early age, which is why in the section on education in the prison notebooks, he really devotes a lot of time to articulating what the education system from a very young age must look like in such a way 
that it will serve Marxist aims and goals. And this is what he calls the common school. Now, the common school uh, for Gramsci is a kind of education that is, on the one hand, universal. It has to be available for everybody. It is uh, compulsory. It has to be mandatory for all kids, independently of what family they come from. Um, the compulsory element, I think, is his way of saying that rich families cannot create alternative private schools. Um, everybody has to send their kids to the same public school in order to avoid education itself replicating the class antagonisms that are already tearing society apart. Now, this is a really huge undertaking, and Gramsci realizes that this is nothing short than a kind of political cultural revolution, where he says, the state, in creating this large system of public, standardized, compulsory education, will have to effectively take over from the family the all-important duty of upbringing of children, of, of rearing children and educating them from a very young age. Um, and so it's essentially the making public of what previously was a purely private responsibility or obligation. Now, the common school that Gramsci envisions in the prison notebooks is largely opposed to what he calls the vocational school. Earlier, I mentioned that we have to keep in mind two different contexts for thinking about his writings on education. One is the context of Marxist theory and this problem of how workers become educated about their own condition. But the other context that we have to think about here is the political context of Italy in the 1920s and 30s in connection to education. Because at the turn of the century, so in the early 1900s, there was a movement for educational reform that was sweeping through Italy and that was in fact pushing education away from the old curriculum, which was heavily um, humanistic, tied to philosophy and language and philology, and toward purely vocational training of students, where all you do is you basically train students to be workers in a particular um, vocation or in a particular trade. So you don't teach them philosophy, you teach them um, plumbing, or you don't teach them art and watercolors, you teach them how to type, for example. And Gramsci worried a lot about this movement pushing Italian society in the wrong direction. And his worry here is that once you start questioning the value of a classical humanistic education, it's very difficult to turn around because by definition, classical education can't really justify itself on instrumental grounds. So if you ask an educator like myself, and I do teach in a humanities program, you know, what, what good are the humanities for? What kind of job do they prepare you to? The problem is that that's the wrong kind of answer. That's the wrong kind of question to ask. By their very essence, the humanities or the classical subjects, which Gramsci calls disinterested, the whole point about them is that they don't translate into a skill that you can use um, in the workplace. Rather, their value is subjective and it has to do with the formation of personality, with your psychology, with your spiritual and personal growth, and with your mode of seeing and interpreting the world. But again, once people start raising questions about education on instrumental market-based grounds, it's very difficult to give a defense of those subjects that don't produce that kind of value, but rather produce a different kind of value that is much more difficult to quantize and that is much more difficult to pinpoint. Now, Gramsci still makes the argument that it's precisely because a humanistic education doesn't have that easily translatable market value, that's, their, that's the value of the humanities. That's why we should keep them around. And again, he says that the common school that he envisions will foreground that kind of humanistic education in order to produce individuals, students, who have a certain outlook on the world. Now, when thinking about this common school, Gramsci really has in mind 
something like a college or like a university experience or a boarding school. Because he talks about, there are a few, uh, a few passages here and there where he kind of lets you know what he's thinking. So for example, at one point he says, in the common school, students would do activities day and night. And then you're reading that and you wonder, wait, at night, how are they going to be doing activity together day and night? And then he mentions dormitories. And then you realize, oh, wow, he envisions kind of like a campus with dormitories where the kids are living there away from their families. And so he really envisions a kind of boarding school experience where kids live in an intellectual community. And this is a kind of education that would begin, again, from an early age, um, let's say four or five, maybe around kindergarten, um, so three, four, five, and that would go until they're about 15, 16, or 17 years old, at which point they would graduate from the Coleman School, and then they would pursue whatever career most interest them, whether that is plumbing or becoming a novelist or becoming a doctor or becoming a construction worker. At that point, it doesn't matter because they will have received a well-grounded um, and well-rounded education. Now, um, the nature of the teaching at the Coleman School, um, he says, has to change so as to mold the mind of the pupil in the right way. So when kids are very young, according to Gramsci, it's okay to have a much more disciplinarian approach to education where you tell them, you need to do this. You need to spend a few hours memorizing your math tables and your grammar rules and, uh, you know, memorizing whatever the countries and their capitals. And you don't really have a choice in this matter. Uh, you just do what the teacher tells you. But as the pupil grows uh, and matures, Education has to start molding the individual so as to become a free thinker. And so it's okay to be a disciplinarian early on, but as the student grows up, as they become 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, we need to start accentuating and enhancing their freedom. So as kids get older, we need to emphasize, he says, autonomous thinking um, what was the term that he uses as opposed to that? As opposed to passive learning. And that means giving individuals um, more choice over their curriculum. Maybe they can have some electives. And also it means changing the way in which teachers relate to them. At an early age, during primary school, the teacher can be a disciplinarian, he says. But by the time the kids are in their teens, the teacher must only be a friendly guide. Uh, and therefore, that means that they have a certain kind of report and respect um, with the student where they recognize the subjectivity and the independence of this other thinker, even if this other thinker remains a student. And this is the only way, according to Gramsci, that education will succeed at giving students a kind of psychological, moral, and spiritual liberation in the course of their education. And that requires that the teacher encourage in the student self-awareness, responsibility, and a kind of worldliness, a kind of worldly outlook where they are open to difference and where they're uh, critical thinkers about their own surroundings. And there's a really important passage in the section on education where he says, the difference between the vocational school and the common school is that the vocational school prepares students for work, but the common school prepares them for life. Now, in terms of how this preparation for life happens, it has a lot to do with subject matter. And this is, again, where his focus on what I'm calling the humanities, um, but he calls it just disinterested subjects, uh, kicks in. He gives a very good example of the value of the humanities. Um, actually, I found it to be a, a really original account of why disinterested study has value for the individual. Uh, he gives the example of Greek and Latin grammar. So in the 19th century in Italy, it was common for kids to be taught the grammatical principles of Greek and Latin. Now, keep in mind, Greek and Latin are dead languages. Nobody speaks Greek and Latin at this point of time anymore. 
Um, and they certainly are not speaking Greek and Latin in the 1920s and 30s. So they're learning the rules of a dead language that really doesn't exist. And so in that sense, that kind of education is the highest expression of a purely disinterested subject. It's not going to get you a job. It's not going to advance your um, career prospects. So why would the common school teach Greek and Latin grammar? Now, Gramsci says, there are a number of reasons why we should not just keep this around, but actually amplify them in the curriculum. So in connection to Greek and Latin grammar, uh, specifically, he says, think about how it gives students historical understanding and historical experience. When kids learn Greek and Latin, they are not just learning abstract rules that have no connection to the real world. They're learning a linguistic worldview, a linguistic schema that once represented the life of a particular community. So it teaches them another way of seeing the world other than their own. And that means that they learn, especially because it's Greek and Latin. And so we're talking about Italy that has where social life and um, even architecture has a lot of Greco-Roman influences. The kids start deepening their understanding of their very surroundings because they understand where their own culture comes from, even where the, the roots of Italian itself, of the language, come from, because a lot of them, of course, come from Latin, it being a Romance language. And so studying at that language gives them this sense of historicization, where they come to see the world around them, their own language, their own culture, their own belief systems as having emerged out of this older mode of life that is no longer around. And that's one benefit, that it historicizes the world. A second benefit is that it dynamicizes or renders dynamic the world as well, especially the world of language. Because when you teach kids in Italy Latin rules, Obviously, they learn that language has evolved over time, that language is not just a static set of rules that has always been like that and that cannot be questioned, but it's rather this living, breathing body of work, a kind of cultural expression that is constantly changing and not static. And Gramsci seems to believe that if kids can come to the realization that language can change and is not static, maybe they will also come to think of society itself as possibly subject to change rather than eternal, natural, and inevitable. And that, of and that, of course, includes class dynamics. So students come to see the world around them and say, if language has evolved, why can't this, whatever this is, evolve as well? Now, Gramsci also talks about how even the most boring aspects of a classical education have value, immense value for students. So when you learn grammar, um, like Latin grammar and Greek grammar, you do have to spend a lot of time sort of just like memorizing things mechanically, right? You have to like remember the numbers, you have to remember the pronouns, you have to remember the rules of conjugation. Anybody that has studied a foreign language knows um, just how tiring and mechanical and repetitive this can be. Gramsci makes a really interesting argument about this mechanicity, about this mechanical activity that requires a lot of physical effort. And he says, look, the value of those seemingly robotic exercises in memorizing grammatical rules and syntactical rules is that they teach young kids a kind of mental focus. They give them experience in how to focus on cognitive activity over protracted periods of time. And the value of that, of maintaining focus and attention, even when it's very difficult, is that that's precisely the kind of skill that you need to have down the road if you're going to be an intellectual of any sort. And so those early exercises in uh, humanistic education actually prepare you for the life of the mind. And the problem for those who um, might think that this is the wrong way of thinking about education, um, 
again, because it's just too repetitive and it doesn't have a concrete um, immediate value for the student. He says the problem is that if you look around Italian society, rich kids are already getting that kind of training in mental focus and mental attention. You know, rich parents often tell their kids, go read a book um, because they have the cultural capital and the cultural resources and the time of leisure for doing that because they're liberated from the demands of work. Um, and so the rich kids are already getting that kind of education. It's just the working class kids and the kids of the peasantry who are never getting it. And that's why those kids rarely succeed at the same rate as wealthy kids once they enter into the school system because wealthy kids already come with a ton of almost invisible privilege um, that other kids don't have. And that's what leads, especially, you know, working class and um, uh, working class kids to develop an inferiority complex. Um, and Gramsci himself talks about it in this way. He says, this is the trick that class plays on the education system that we think kids are getting all their education in the school, but without the common school, they're actually getting a lot of education at the home. It's just that only the rich kids are getting the kind of education that is going to allow them down the road to go into those leadership positions, to be a doctor, to be a lawyer, to be a politician, to be a president, whereas working class kids are only getting the message from their parents to no fault of their own that they just need to become workers like their parents. Now, let me conclude here with just two ideas. The first one is that Gramsci's critique of the vocational school is rooted in his conviction that the vocational school gives the impression of being democratic because everybody can choose whatever career they want, when in practice, it merely creates a new version of separate estates where the wealthy kids are being canalized or channeled into high achieving, high paying careers and poor kids are being canalized into trade professions. And so there is an illusion here or a mental trick um, that is being performed by the educational system and that maintains class antagonism and class oppression. Now, the second thing, and I, I found this really prescient actually, even though Gramsci spends a lot of time in, on education talking about the value of classical training, again, focusing on Greco-Roman grammar, Greco-Roman art, Greco-Roman uh, literature and philosophy, he says, look, Italian society is changing and we're not really seeing ourselves anymore as just the descendants of Greco-Roman antiquity. And because culture today is changing, we might want to change the things that we teach our kids in the common school that, you know, hopefully will exist in the future. And so maybe we need to invent a new humanities curriculum that is no longer beholden to just the Greco-Roman world. And he says, look, that's really difficult. I don't really know what the new humanistic curriculum will look like, but we need to find new material that is still disinterested, that is not about getting a job, that is not about making money, that is not about turning you into a worker, and that focuses on that personal, psychological, and spiritual growth and in instilling critical thinking in the students. And so already in the 1920s, he's both giving us a defense of the humanities or disinterested education, while recognizing that that disinterested education might have to break from its Eurocentric past and find new ways of serving students in the present.